what I teach a lot about is where are the lines between cultural exchange and appropriation, right? Cultural exchange can be great. Obviously, that's how the world works, whether you like it or not. People exchange ideas, and within exchange ideas, they exchange aesthetics. People like to surround themselves with beautiful things. People like to put beautiful things on their bodies, at least a lot of people do. Um, and so these things are going to be exchanged, but how do you do that in a way that benefits everyone involved and gives the people who are the kind of core of this aesthetic or core of this style the credit that they deserve? And a lot of it does have to do with giving credit where it's due. Um, whether that be monetarily, whether that just be in reference, in saying this is where I got this idea, or whether that be in really letting them take the lead within that kind of design or that aesthetic, um, and you kind of acting more supportively if you really want to work in that same aesthetic, right? Uh, but you kind of have to go from a perspective of you're being invited into this. Uh, I think the problem is that there is still this mentality and a lot of Again, I'm going to say the Western world, um, but in a lot of spaces that we can go and take and this is something pretty and I'm going to go buy this and I'm going to use this and I'm going to make it something that's my own and that's fine without having to acknowledge where those ideas, where those aesthetics came from. And so I, I do think that idea of kind of taking, right, it's like that old like the British archaeologist goes into Egypt and just takes stuff, brings it back to the British Museum, and, and nobody says anything about it until however many hundreds of years later. Um, and then all of a sudden people are like, mm, I should probably go back to Egypt. Uh, so I think that's, that's the issue too, is there is this history of kind of like going into spaces, taking, and then leaving, um, which is something that anthropology has been trying to get around for ages. Someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we and what is the nature of this reality? Five, four, three, two, one. What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We are still on site at the American Anthropological Association's annual meeting in Vancouver, British Columbia for our second partnership with them. We are now going to be talking about fashion anthropology and so much more. We have Anais Parada joining us on the show. Hi, Anais. Hi. Thanks for coming on the program. Thank you for inviting me. I'm excited to be here. Likewise. Very pumped to be interviewing <laughs> you. Anais is a PhD candidate in cultural anthropology at the University of South Carolina. And I'm pumped to dive into the depth. You've been to Ecuador five times. Mm -hmm. You're now doing a PhD thesis on this topic that we're gonna get to, but we want to take things from a perspective of, well, we love asking our guests about all this big picture stuff that's happening. Are we really all one? <laughs> well, that's a very big question, as you well know. Um, there's lots of ways to look at that if you're looking at kind of various scales, and as anthropologists, we kind of like to piece apart, okay, what context are we talking about? Who and or what are we talking about? But if you want to pull back and go to kind of the biggest scale, say universally, are we all one? Mm. I think to some extent the answer would be yes and whether we like it or not. Um, and I say that because I think a lot of people aren't consciously thinking of their connection to whether it be other human beings or even kind of the natural environment or even the built environment or even what I work with is material culture, so the objects we use in daily life, how those actually mediate relationships, right? Um, that we are all interconnected in particular ways because that means that you have more of a responsibility than you might be willing to take on. Um, you know, we like to think about if we're all interconnected, then we have this great possibility to affect change, and we always think of that as a very positive thing. But it also means you have the ability to affect negative change, right? Um, even that you're not necessarily conscious of. So I do think there is this kind of ebb and flow where things kind of work together. And, and in that sense, I think, yes, we're all kind of part of this information universe feeding back on itself. 
Mm. So no matter what way we really look at the origin of how we're here, it all goes back to one, whether you call it a source or a God or an all that is, or a universe or Big Bang, whatever you want to call it, the one. All of these pluralistic coexisting ideologies, philosophies, religions point back to a way that we find ourselves here and the reason being, what do you think? Why are we here? I don't think I have an answer for that. I don't think many people do. That's why there are several answers to that. That's why philosophy deals with that. That's why the arts deal with that. Anthropology specifically deals with that through the actions of people. So we're looking at why do people behave the way they do in groups with one another? Why do they react to their environment in particular ways? And all of that is going to be very, very context specific, right? Um, so you kind of have to pull back this idea of, okay, what's our purpose? And really look at instead, okay, what's my purpose in this moment affecting change with these people around me? What's my purpose within the society as opposed to what's my purpose outside of the society? Because for many people, there isn't necessarily this purpose outside of the society. You know, in some communities, it very much is what happens to the community happens to you and vice versa. Um, so, you know, I would say broadly, yeah, I don't have an answer for that. I can look at it from different contexts for different individuals. I can say, broadly speaking, my purpose is to create more empathy. And mm. I think that for most anthropologists, they would say the end goal is to create more empathy. Mm. Uh, so that we can coexist in ways that are beneficial not just to ourselves, but to, again, the natural environment, the built environment beyond ourselves. So that's kind of maybe at the core of the core of anthropology as a discipline, but I'm sure there will be arguments from other disciplines that mm. there's <laughs> a different purpose. I really like the purpose of bringing more empathy to the world, trying to get behind the eyes of all different types of walks of life. I really like that a lot. Trying to design, architect a social fabric that enables everyone to flourish and bring their unique gifts forth, that treats the biosphere as though it mm -hmm. is all interconnected. Um, do, does it feel like the most upstream issue are our feelings of lack of interconnectedness, our feelings of separation? and that's causing all of the downstream symptomatic problems? I mean, I think that, again, you're saying we. I think that, to a certain extent, that feeling of disconnectedness is very much a, a Western feeling, um, and particularly like a Western US feeling mm. of, and you know, they've done studies on, on how, let's say, white Western men feel very disconnected, right? They don't have a place and they're losing an idea of like who they are in this world. And I would say um, that a lot of that has to do with capitalism and consumerism and the way that it plays out in the Western world. Because again, we don't want to take these overarching ideas like capitalism um, without situating them in a particular context, cultural context, a social context. Um, so I would say that yes, that's a huge problem. Uh, and I would say that it's an expanding problem as kind of globalization as a process has always existed. But globalization as it exists today, some of the Western ideologies, including individualism and consumerism and things like this, they might contribute to kind of this feeling of loss of community, this feeling of um, not being able to empathize with other people because you feel isolated yourself is then what we can take from areas of indigeneity, again, needing to put it into specific contexts, um, just indigeneity that has deep roots in interconnectedness with all, um, and doing things like being able to marry that with modernity and metropolises, respect for the air you breathe, the water you drink, the food you eat, the other humans. You would never tell people lies. You would never try and self-deal for yourself. You share the extra gathering that you get with everyone. They do the same thing when they bring it back. Are these some of the principles that need to be brought into the modernity in order for us to flourish the best we can? 
yes, I would say that uh, certain principles which we associate with indigeneity with particular groups, because again, we don't want to look at indigeneity as just one kind of monolithic thing, um, but there are certain kind of principles that, that come up within indigenous groups that should be integrated into modernity, but again, it's also problematic to kind of put this dichotomy between indigeneity and modernity, because that's part of what I look at is how we historicize indigenous populations mm. and how we relegate them to the past, to this older way of thought, to these older practices, when they've been practicing these things alongside us in modern contemporary culture. You know, to be an indigenous person in the world is to be a contemporary. So yes, I think it's not just integrating it into modern life, I think it's integrating it into certain, again, kind of Western, particularly US ideologies that are coming from these hegemonic institutions. Albeit there is a lot of complexity that goes post using the word indigeneity, understandably so many different combinatorics of indigenous life. In order for w one to aim to disseminate awakening messaging to a myriad of worldviews around the planet, it is really helpful to try and synthesize and try and mm -hmm. boil things down. Mm -hmm. uh, and it does seem like if you put a big plus sign in between indigeneity and modernity and put that up as a meme, people would at least somewhat understand mm -hmm. from just two words and a plus sign kind of what you're getting at yeah. in terms of uh, trying to drive society forward in a direction that is more yeah. beneficial. Yeah. Yeah, and Canada's doing it in many ways quite well. They they respect their First Nations mm -hmm. um, a, 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 like quite a bit from what I've um, heard and seen while being here. And the U.S. has a history of um, having like an order of magnitude more people and um, a, a, a economy that's significantly larger and mm -hmm. just. Um, more complexity with the indigenous that were first here when we came, plus the entire southern part of the United States that had a lot of other um, Central Americans that were there as well, just and Americans mm -hmm. in general that were there. Um, the transatlantic slave trade, um, also Japanese internment camps. I mean, there's just like this never ending list of problematic issues that mm -hmm. um, the U.S. faced. And so there's really tough to figure out the traumatic healing that needs to happen, but it does start with the actual process of truly aiming to heal mm -hmm. said things. Mm -hmm. And it's really, it's up to the biggest powers, um, I think, uh, the, the top of the wealthiest people, the biggest corporations, the biggest governments to truly propagate memes of unconditional love and inclusive stakeholding and and the emerging markets, all the emerging technologies, try and democratize the fruits instead of have the 1% take 50% of the emerging fruits mm -hmm. of those markets. I mean, uh, the principles, I think, are quite more commonsensical than, we're, than we even, um, uh, we just, anthropologists are very good at explaining the sheer complexity of things, but if we can boil it down to like, mm -hmm. a, like a fifth grader in graphs mm -hmm. on like what needs to happen. I think overall the planet's like, yeah, that's like pretty much the the reality mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. Well, and well, one of the things I believe is that anthropology should be taught very, very early on. Yeah. That people, some students do get it in high school now, but generally speaking, those are going to be from kind of wealthier areas and. Um, there's not a lot of widespread anthropology in high school, let alone things like middle school and elementary school. And it's not that it's such a complex discipline that you can't teach it. I mean, really, what we're talking about is, again, how humans behave and how humans behave in groups. And that's the very core of how we exist in daily life. It's very strange to me that we don't start teaching about it um, and teaching about variations and diversity and empathy and all these things at a very, very young age. And so first I would say I think, I think that would be hugely beneficial. Um, and then just in terms of kind of where does this work need to come from and simplification, I think that 
simpli simplification is useful in terms of if you want to market something, right? You want the, the cleanest idea. You want something people can have an emotional attachment to, um, and they process it, and that's going to stick in their head, and, and it's going to make them buy this thing or go to this place or whatever it might be. Um, and I, but I also think that we need to give people a little bit more credit, because I think a lot of people do get that first kind of taste of this is what this is about or this is the main idea. And when they feel comfortable with that, they do start to get interested in, OK, let's go deeper. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the context. Let's look at the difference. Because uh, it doesn't take away from the main idea. It only totally, adds to it. Totally. It's just extra data, extra support, right? Double clicking in when you do get the initial yes. um, <laughs> meme of interest captured, then you want to dive deeper. Um, I also like how you put that uh, if you get young kids um, realizing that they themselves are artists and anthropologists mm -hmm. at the youngest possible ages uh, and you get them doing things like fun field work uh, <laughs> and then create like project-based learning around that field work, solving the SDGs, mm -hmm. all this type of stuff, um, you can have a pretty solid uh, foundation in childhood education. Mm -hmm. um, I really like the idea of anthropology coming in at really young ages. Um, I want to pass uh, time getting into uh, like who you were growing up that got you to become interested in Quito and Ecuador mm -hmm. um, and indigeneity and fashion anthropology. How did you even get interested in all this? So uh, it's been a long journey. I was born in Bolivia to a Bolivian father, an American mother. When, when they met, they traveled quite a bit. They lived in South America for a while. My two oldest brothers were raised there. My sister and I were born there, but we weren't raised there. We were raised in the US. Um, so I always kind of had this strange identity because where I was growing up was a, a very Latinx kind of neighborhood, um, but it was predominantly Mexican-American, some Puerto Rican-American, you know. Uh, there were no Bolivian Americans, and pretty much mm, my entire youth, I never saw anyone who was like me in the sense of a Bolivian American woman. Um, now, uh, I've kind of, with social media actually, with Instagram, I found you know some Bolivian American activists, artists, actually a fashion designer in California. Um, so these people are are coming up, but I didn't have social media like I do now. So. I struggled a lot with my identity because I was Latina in a community with lots of Latinas, but they weren't the same Latina. Mm -hmm. And so the ways that I would dress, for instance, I was very aware to not dress in ways that were specifically, let's say, Mexican-American, which is also you're a child, you're naive, you know, whatever else. It wouldn't have mattered. But, you know, in my head, I was looking for kind of my own identity both within and outside of that at the same time, which is very difficult. So and my mother was always interested in anthropology. She's not an anthropologist. It's just something she loved. Um, I got that love from her. But you know, again, being a teenager, when I decided to go to college, I was like, no, I'm going to be an English major. That lasted not that long. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I got, there's great work that you can do in English, but I wanted something that was more practical. I don't want to say practical, but it just more deeply embedded in lived experience, I mm. guess. Um, I really I don't know a great way to say that, but I kind of gave in to anthropology because it's something I had always loved, but I was just trying to stay away from it. Uh, got into it, ended up studying abroad in Ecuador, made friends there, and then I actually worked as a legal advocate for domestic violence victims for a few years. And then applied to graduate school and went back to anthropology. And so as soon as I went back, I knew Ecuador was the region I wanted to be in. It was an Andean nation, so it shares a lot of similarities with Bolivia. Um, and I wanted to explore a place that would be both kind of personally mattering to me because of that context, because it was Andean, because I could get a little bit of an understanding of what my parents were dealing with raising us or what my dad's background was. And I do feel like I've gotten insight into, for instance, my father's personality much more um, by doing this work. So in that sense, that's kind of why I wanted to work in the Andes, why I wanted to work with um, processes of like mestizaje. And as far as the fashion stuff, that's just something I've always been interested in, in terms of 
how fashion makes meaning. Mm. And I actually didn't realize initially that anthropology of fashion could be a thing. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it existed. And so it wasn't until after I got my master's that I started kind of naturally finding other people who had talked about the same things, oftentimes not calling them fashion anthropologists, but calling themselves material culture people, um, calling themselves cultural anthropologists with a focus on regional dress styles, things like that. Mm -hmm. And so I realized I could do it and I just went all in. When was the first trip, this was studying abroad, mm -hmm. f for undergrad? For undergrad, undergrad, yes. What year was that trip? Whew, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. No, but I honestly, uh, I don't remember. That would have been over 10 years ago. Okay, so 10 years ago. It was a while ago. So, mm -hmm. okay, so 10 years ago on the first trip, you... You start, did you say you were starting to do work with domestic violence? So that was after I graduated. After you graduated, mm -hmm. doing work domestic violence f pe pe from? I so actually, I did have Ecuadorian clients, but it was here. It, it was, was here. in okay. the Chicago area. Okay. Um, and I worked primarily with immigrant women, um, Spanish-speaking. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, and were they... Um, uh, d d they, they were having domestic uh, issues, but in the Chicago area. Yes, exactly. Okay, because okay, we did another um, episode um, on the show here at AAA where it was um, uh, like uh, mm -hmm. a forced migration or asylum seeking yes, or refugees okay. for, mm -hmm. from domestic violence in those areas. Yeah, yeah. Okay. and it is still okay. a huge issue yeah. within Ecuador. Yeah, and with um, uh, uh, especially female seeking um, refuge mm -hmm. um, from domestic violence issues. Yeah, okay. All right, and then, so then then you went back again in master's. Yep. For master's, okay. Mm -hmm. Then this was, when I read this, I thought, okay, let's talk, we gotta talk about social media and smartphone tech mm -hmm. in Quito, Ecuador. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I see how you're, you know, you're trying to understand Bolivia through Ecuador, through the mm -hmm. Andean yeah. area. And then also through, uh, also, understanding your father as well, like mm -hmm. you were describing to us earlier. So what are the discoveries that you made in that master's thesis? Um, just in general? Yeah, because, Roswell. yeah, because, I mean, you also gave us, uh, we talk a lot on the show about the nuance of social media, mm -hmm. and yeah, there's some up stuff with yeah. the uh, attention economy business plan models um, and mental health issues and all this different type of stuff. But there's also incredible things like you being able to find other Bolivians that are mm -hmm. working in um, the United States or on different projects in Bolivia as well. And it's just a good way to network um, based on, on that as well. So I just wanted to mm -hmm. also say that. So how were they using social media and smartphone tech? So the, the most interesting thing, kind of the crux of what I found out is there, I will say the time I was there, because it's gonna be several years ago now. Um, but at the time I was there, there were a lot of programs coming up to make Ecuador kind of more of a tech savvy, media heavy environment. Um, they had a program called Yachai, I believe it was. I think that's the name of it. Oh no, Yasuni, sorry, I'm Yasuni. And it was supposed to be an Amazonian region and it was supposed to be essentially their answer to Silicon Valley. Mm. And part of what was interesting about it and so promising and why everybody in Ecuador was excited about it, was that by doing this, by putting essentially this university that was all, also kind of like a tech hub where people could work, could study, they were protecting the natural resources underneath it because by putting that there, the president basically said, this is how we're going to kind of make money in this region, this is how we're gonna advance this region instead of drilling, mm. right? Instead of using these natural resources. So those natural resources were protected and it was theoretically going to benefit the community. Now that since has gone nowhere, it's gone. Um, but it was at this time when these things were really kind of pressing and Ecuador was really trying to like figure out ways to participate in this world. And what I was looking at specifically was how are the divisions between the general mestizo population, so the population that we in the U.S. would probably call Latino, Latinx, that mixed, mixed, kind of white Spanish ancestry with indigenous ancestry, that's the mainstream population. How is that population using technology in ways that differ from the indigenous population? Mm -hmm. And the government had this rhetoric through its programs 
that indigenous people needed help using technology, they needed classes, they weren't kind of as advanced or tapped in as the general mestizo population who was living in cities and was very mobile and you know whatever else. And I really didn't find that to be the case, particularly with smartphones, because of the mobility of smartphones, because it didn't need the infrastructure that something like landlines would, mm -hmm. that actually indigenous people were using it and they were using it to keep up with you know, friends and relatives in different countries who were traveling, selling goods or whatever they might be doing. So this whole narrative of the nation state was actually basically the opposite. This, the most advanced technology or the more advanced technology is what they had because mm. that's what they were able to use, let's say, you know, in the Highland Mountains or in more rural areas because there wasn't the infrastructure for something like landline telephones or like televisions or whatever else. So they would have the most cutting edge technology for the, this in the, because they were in such a remote location to mm -hmm. be able to communicate with others. So they would actually have like an actual cell phone. Yeah, they would have satellite. like an actual smartphone. And, you know, it might not be the most expensive version of that, yeah. you know, but some Ecuadorian mestizos in the city didn't have the most expensive version of that uh, just because uh, they're very, there are very high taxes on imports in Ecuador. Yeah. So technology is incredibly expensive in general. Um, Interesting. But they would have essentially something on par with, yeah. you know, Normal, yeah. at least the yeah. rest of the metropolis even, just they would have similar yeah. tech. Okay, okay. And this is, all, this is also, um, this brings up another point from one of our interviews with uh, Leslie Clark on um, uh, indigenous nomadic people of um, Nigeria and how um, they are also using um, telecommunications technologies like smartphones through like WhatsApp voice messages mm -hmm. to each other. And I think that's also really interesting for them to pick up a technology that enables them to do stuff like send each other those voice messages. And they've been able to unlock a whole new uh, array of, of, um, of uh, behaviors and um, of, uh, of uh, cooperative uh, uh, tasks that they're able mm -hmm. to achieve based mm -hmm. on that. So it's, it, it's really interesting hearing about what, what can people that are now being introduced to like this voice technology, um, what can they um, accomplish now? Okay, so that's some of the, uh, the tech discoveries that you did in the masters, okay. Yeah. Okay, and then you went, then um, you, came, you came back. Yep. And then you decided um, to do University of South Carolina mm -hmm. for the PhD in anthropology. Mm -hmm. And then it want, you wanted to go again um, to study Ecuador. Yes. But this time through a more of a fashion mm -hmm. anthropological lens. Mm -hmm. Okay, take us on this journey. Okay, so when I was doing my master's field work, I had already started unknowingly thinking about my PhD field work because I was already asking questions about dress. Uh, one of the people that I interviewed, who's known as um, like, one of his names is like the Quechua gamer, he does robotics. Mm. Um, but he's Quechua, which is an indigenous population from the area. Um, so he always, when he's, when there are newspaper articles written about him or like TV shows highlighting him, whatever it may be, he's, I would say always, I don't, I'm trying to think of a time when I haven't seen him wearing it, but he'll wear like traditional garb at the very least. He'll wear the poncho with um, kind of the white, traditional white pant and shirt underneath uh, as a means of representing his indigeneity in these very high tech spaces, right? To help kind of break this dichotomy, again, what we're talking about between indigeneity and modernity, this idea that they're not one and the same. Mm -hmm. And so he's very, openly using this dress as kind of a marker, a cue of identity. And of so, indigeneity? Of that. In modernity, of his mm -hmm, subculture exactly. of indigeneity within modernity. Exactly. Yeah, I've actually noticed that we had uh, a Kogi elder on the show from Colombia, mm -hmm. and they also wear it all white. Mm -hmm. They have a very distinct hat. They have their very distinct items that they carry with them, mm -hmm. very spiritual items, and you can tell Mm -hmm. They've, you know, their striped bags that they have, and it's just like, that's interesting. So clothing, exterior clothing, can also be a tell mm -hmm. of where someone is in their, what subculture they belong to indigenously, mm -hmm. in the middle of like a busy street in a metropolis. Absolutely. And it's one of those things, what I like to look at is how this creates 
what I call semiotic communities, but talking about it not through language, but through the language of dress. Yeah. Um, so essentially, there's lots of different subgroups. There's 14 recognized indigenous nations within Ecuador, but that's because one of those nations is just Quechua, which actually is a language, not necessarily just a population. And within that, there's actually several different populations. So the Purua, who I work with, are considered Quechua sometimes when it's like talked about in like tourist brochures or whatever mm -hmm. else. They may be kind of wrapped into that, but they consider themselves their own specific cultural group. Pronounce this again, the Puruha. <laughs> Purua. Purua. Yeah, Purua. it's the accent is at the end. Yeah. Um, it's Purua. the Quechua language structure, but okay. they, so they have particular regional dress and other groups that are considered Quechua or within the kind of Quechua broader designation all have regional styles. So if you have enough knowledge about it, you see somebody walking down the street, you can tell, okay, that person's from Otavalo, that person's from Rio Bamba. Mm. You know, you can see what even towns and provinces people are from if you have that knowledge. Mm. But in order to have that knowledge, for the most part, either you're part of the community or you study it, mm -hmm. right? So if you are part of that community and you, and this actually did happen to uh, one of my interviewees, she was talking about the fact that she went to the U.S. and she was, I think, in St. Louis or someplace and she was going to a church and she saw a woman wearing a specific regional dress style that she recognized and she was just like overwhelmed. Yeah. Because, you know, that's my person. I, I know exactly where that person's from. Not just I know what country that person's from based on their accent or whatever else, but I know what province and town you're from and, and your community. And I can maybe pull a name or two out of my Yeah, bucket. to say yeah. very much so. Yeah, yeah. Very much so within my community. A lot of people know each other. The, some of the fashion designers I work with that are the most prominent. I learned this too late in the field the first time around. But um, I should have been name dropping because mm -hmm. as soon as I did, people were like, oh, yeah, I know that brand. I know that designer. Like, I really love her stuff, mm. you know, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So there definitely is this community that gets built just based on being able to recognize that person. Yeah. So then does this then become something that we can have the influence of a consumeristic, capitalistic uh, modernity just, uh, you know, in, in a non, uh, like, ethically thought out way, just take, take root in? I mean, it just, it, the, those things don't feel, like, we get that they, that there's this beautiful way of, like, having, uh, decorating this sacred vehicle of the body and then being able to see somebody else and like that's so profoundly interesting mm -hmm. to like to be able to do that but then when it becomes like there's just something about it that when it like when someone goes and like i don't know could you imagine like an indigenous division to like louis vuitton or something like where they go and like try and like make you know, like work with indigenous people there to try and make like really high priced or even like, you know, low priced from like, I don't know, Nike or something mm -hmm. would find out how to do it or whatever. But just like, or even just an, or even just an independent uh, fashion designer that then like makes a, you know, like an Instagram account for mm -hmm. the uh, Puruja mm -hmm. and then decides to, um, to work with them and give them money and then they get fueled by, you know, capitalism to, to, to get, mm -hmm out of poverty is mm -hmm. like what the cell is. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about all of that? It's complex. Um, one, the designers, I think one of the issues too is I'm looking at it in a very local context slash national context. I'm looking at it in the context of Ecuador right now. And so mestizo people in Ecuador aren't wearing indigenous clothing. They have access to it and they can afford, some of them can afford. I'm, I'm talking about also like there's, you know, obviously class issues that go into this, uh, different, you know, other factors that go into this. But some designers are very, very 
high end, they're making very expensive pieces. So Sisa, who is one of the designers I work with, her mm -hmm. brand is Sumak Churai, and one of her blouses could cost around $140, right? So that's, especially in Ecuador, where the income level, I wanna say it's average like 300 a month, something like that. It's a very, very expensive piece. And it is all couture, she hand makes it, I've seen her make them. Um, so these are very expensive pieces, but you know there are wealthier people in Ecuador, whether they be indigenous or mestizo or something else, part of the immigrant population, um, who can afford these pieces, but they're not necessarily going to wear them. And I, I argue that there are several reasons for that. Um, part of it having to do with the history of racism, which mm. I'm sure, you know, uh, part of it having to do with the process of mestizaje there, which is this process of whitening, that when the Spanish came, people started mixing, they freaked out, and uh, obviously they're always gonna like preference whiteness, right? Um, so trying to whiten people, so, um, basically have more white partners so that slowly you know, the, the population becomes whiter and whiter. Um, but because of this process of mixing, unlike, to an extent, again, all of this has variations, but to an extent, unlike in the US where they came in and just wiped out the population, there was a much more subtle kind of wiping out. But in that process, it means that a lot of mestizo people look like indigenous people. I could pass for indigenous there if I wore that style of dress. I have, like Sisa has about the same skin tone as me, we have similar features, things like that. Um, and so I, I do, one of the arguments I make is that these kind of lingering ideas, this fear of passing as one or the other, mm. um, keeps them from wearing indigenous dress. But I think it also is a respect thing, understanding that this is part of also culture and heritage and not wanting to take that, not yeah. wanting to appropriate that. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of both sides of the coin. Uh, oh, so, it's a market opportunity. Look, really? Right. It's a it, market opportunity to cut down trees and you know build houses mm -hmm. with them. Right. I mean, there's got to be a point where we figure out you know, it's a market opportunity for me to burn fossil fuels, pollute the air. Right, and, right, you know, right, it's right, like right. It, we, There's got to be a point, right? Yeah. It, yeah, yeah. And at some point, people are they they are somewhat self-aware. Like maybe this isn't for me. That's not to say that there aren't mestizo people. Uh, white people in Ecuador who are appropriating indigenous, let's say, patterns and designs, because certainly that happens. Mm. A lot of uh, wow. these like folk art galleries, when you go down there, they're really beautifully curated galleries. Some of them have indigenous things, but some of them are, you know, mestizo made things, or even um, what I'm saying white, so like just Spanish, um, or just, let's say, German immigrants or something like that. These people making things sometimes in conjunction with indigenous communities, but sometimes not. And even when they are in conjunction with indigenous communities, they're not saying, I worked with this indigenous designer. They're saying, I worked with this community and I did so much good and I helped them and, but this, my name is on this yeah. because this is my design. Yeah. Um, so there's issues like that that I worry. Anthropologists call this like extractive versus like community driven, collaborative. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. and so, uh, that would be what I would worry about if, let's say, there was a movement in the U.S., there was an interest in this style, and these very high-end, well-known designers start working with indigenous communities, because we see it in the U.S., that there are fair trade brands, that there are these companies that you know will sell shoes with uh, weavings on them that are indigenous. Yeah. But they don't talk about the indigenous designers as designers, as artists. They talk about them as a community in need, that they're helping. And it's still marked as their brand, not as a brand coming from within the community. So I would worry wow. about that. Um, but I will say within the US uh, that US native designers have been doing an excellent job just, there are some beautiful US designers. Uh, Bee Yellowtail is one of them. She has an amazing line of clothing that I cannot afford, but I wish I could. Um, so a lot of this is just, I don't even think you need that collaboration, is basically what I'm trying to get at. I think they're, you know, these designers are doing it for themselves. They're much more entrepreneurial than I am. Um, they, they have amazing 
I mean, they're just amazing, talented designers, regardless of background. And so I don't think that they need that help. I think they're going to get there one way or the other. And in part, I think they're going to get there because I think people are becoming disillusioned with those other high-end brands. Are we, are, we, are we talking like macro level perspective? There's different um, subcultures of indigeneity across the world mm -hmm. that all have their own unique like patterns and clothing mm -hmm. styles and ways to make shoes and ways to make pots and pottery and all different kinds mm -hmm. of things. And then we're talking about like someone either like goes to one of those subcultures and like learns that process and brings it back and then uh, to their home land that, mm. is, that is a modern place and then they themselves decide to create a business around what they learned mm. and then then the, some of the more I guess so this is where someone could say like a problematic issue mm. occurs when maybe the person does not acknowledge whatsoever where they learned mm -hmm. this craft from this art from mm -hmm. um, if they don't care at all about giving back in some way again like mm -hmm. what do you do when you give back what does that even mean how do you do that how do you give recognition mm -hmm. how do you tell a story about those about that so it preserves the subculture that we're talking about mm -hmm. so that's the macro level that you're yeah I mean um, this concept of what I teach a lot about is where are the lines between cultural exchange and appropriation right Cultural exchange can be great. Obviously, that's how the world works, whether you like it or not. People exchange ideas, and within exchange ideas, they exchange aesthetics. People like to surround themselves with beautiful things. People like to put beautiful things on their bodies, at least a lot of people do. Um, and so these things are going to be exchanged, but how do you do that in a way that benefits everyone involved and gives the people who are the kind of core of this aesthetic or core of this style the credit that they deserve. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it does have to do with giving credit where it's due, mm -hmm. um, whether that be monetarily, whether that just be in reference, in saying, this is where I got this idea, or whether that be in really letting them take the lead within that kind of design or that aesthetic, um, and you kind of acting more supportively if you really want to work in that same aesthetic, right? Uh, but you kind of have to go from a perspective of, you're being invited into this. Uh, I think the problem is that there is still this mentality in a lot of, again, I'm gonna say the Western world, um, but in a lot of spaces that we can go and take and this is something pretty and I'm gonna go buy this and I'm gonna use this and I'm going to make it something that's my own and that's fine without having to acknowledge where those ideas, where those aesthetics came from. And so I, I do think that idea of kind of taking, right? It's like that old, like, the British archaeologist goes into Egypt and just takes stuff, brings it back to the British Museum, and, and nobody says anything about it until however many hundreds of years later. Um, and then all of a sudden people are like, mm, that should probably go back to Egypt. Uh, so I think that's, that's the issue, too, is there is this history of kind of, like, going into spaces, taking, and then leaving, um, which is something that anthropology has been trying to get around for ages. <laughs> so, oh so man, lot. that one. Yeah, that's r interesting. Um, cultural exchange versus appropriation, mm -hmm. and what the hell's in the nuance of that? Yeah. So cultural, yeah, exactly. And cultural exchange um, is going to again be that more balanced. What does that mean? We're balanced and we're like, what does that means, mean? Means again, a asking. You know, asking them when you're there. Yeah. Hey, would it Let's be okay? Say, so that's the first step. Is yep. Okay, so yeah. yeah, let's do this breakdown. Yeah. Point number one. So let's let's just Ask. come up with a scenario because that's the easiest way to like have this imaginary scenario because there's all nuances to all different types, right? There's a difference if you're staying with a host family and they want you to wear traditional dress to a family gathering versus if you're just going in and you're like, let me throw on a kimono. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So let's say you're going to a Latin American indigenous community. You really like... Um, something, the weaving pattern, right? So the first thing you might wanna do, if you like this weaving pattern, or you like this uh, aesthetic, and you're like, oh, I kind of wanna, I wanna use some of that, ask 
your, like, your clothing is what comes to mind. Like, mm -hmm. what if they had picked that pattern of, right. you know, boats, sail, right. sail boats that are like that? And, and is this is this a very widespread pattern already? Does mm. it exist in multiple spaces? Mm. Is there anything sacred? Exactly. Is there anything sacred. sacred or very kind of deeply personal for the heritage or the community or the family that it would be strange? Um, like, you don't want to put a sacred print on a pair of thong, right, or thong underwear. Um, that kind of idea of like, okay, where is this going also? Yeah, yeah. So what does this mean to the community? Directly asking, would you be okay if I use this or something similar? Also similarity, if it's, there's a difference between wearing a full kimono, right, or having a dress that you design that has a kimono sleeve. It just has a, you know, sure. that shape of sleeve. Sure. That's different. Um, That's interesting. Too. So there's there's levels parts, of nuance, okay. right? Yeah. And and maybe a couple sailboats instead of just the whole sheet of exactly, uh, yeah, right? Okay. Or maybe okay. it's okay to have it on a blouse, but not necessarily like you don't want it on shoes, shoes. because there's something associated with the feet and the ground dirt or dirt, something. Yeah. Exactly. So there's all these little nuances, but and in order to have good, more or less, it's, there's always going to be a power imbalance one way or the other, um, for whatever reason, but as equal as you can get it, part of that, the basis of that is having knowledge and seeking that knowledge out honestly. And one of the problems is with these corporations or even with these high-end designers is they don't care because they know they can make the money off it. And then you know, when it's called appropriation by the community or the other designer, if let's say it's an indigenous designer, um, calls them out for what they're doing, They'll just kind of either pay it off or kind of let it fade in the background because that designer doesn't have the clout yet, doesn't have the status yet to really make enough waves that it would put this, let's say, Louis Vuitton out of business, right? So, yeah, so that's kind of that, really the core of whether it's cultural exchange or appropriation has a lot to do with knowledge and has a lot to do with just straight up asking and power, trying to keep power as balanced as possible. Damn. Wow. Okay. So, damn, this is really interestingly complex. Um, yeah, who would have thought that, yeah, that something like, uh, yeah, fashion anthropology would come down to uh, cultural exchange versus appropriation uh, in, in many ways. And I think mm -hmm. this is, that's, that's a really interesting point within the fashion anthropology. And actually, you were mentioning this earlier, too, is just in archaeology's had the same problem mm -hmm. of cultural exchange versus uh, appropriation because you, you this is happening on well, where are all the artifacts right. uh, from before they make it to all these museums in these metropolises mm -hmm. where do they come from mm -hmm. well, indigenous people are mad because they a lot a lot of them were put there by indigenous people for very specific sacred reasons that we then bury we dig them up and then put them in the museums and then there are imbalances that occur mm -hmm. in natural areas because we don't understand that type mm -hmm. of intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, we're trying to use rationality for something that may be a little bit more intuitive that mm -hmm. rationality needs to somehow be able to understand but it's trying, I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's hard because intuition can sometimes also be strangely wrong, I guess, also. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because, yeah, anyway. Uh, so, do you have this big issue with cultural appropriation versus exchange happening and you figure out like is this just a sleeve of the kimono is this the whole thing mm -hmm. is this just a little tiny three boats of the pattern mm -hmm. is this on the whole entire uh are we putting this on wallpaper now um is this not supposed to go on the shoes or a thong is this supposed to go only on like a sacred maybe earring or something um and uh, how do you ask? How do you even ask? When I go there and I see something great, you know, what do I say? How do I, how do I engage them in, a, if I am a massive corporation, that's completely different mm -hmm. than if I'm just like some independent, you know, kid that's coming to visit that is, just became fascinated and wants to be a, a cultural exchange anthropologist with them mm -hmm. maybe. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what would you, like, what would that circumstance look like if I'm, you know, if I'm just, kid and I only have that much power and I'm really interested in cultural exchange versus if you're a corporation and you have that mm -hmm. much power and you're trying to ask them questions about where you can actually put that pattern. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, um, let's say if you're just a kid going in, I think a lot of times the stuff you're going to encounter anyway 
some of that is going to be for sale, right? Um, some of that is going to be things that you kind of know at the outset, at least I can purchase those things because those things are being sold directly to me, um, regardless of whether or not I can take that and then use it for my own um, product. But really it's about, regardless of if you're a big company or an individual person, it's about building community. Mm. And that's kind of the answer sometimes people don't want to hear because that's the answer that takes time. Yeah. Um, you really have to spend time with people. And you know, it's one of those things, um, in Latin America, it's still kind of a thing in a lot of open air markets, whether it be a food market or you know an artisan market or whatever, that you have one vendor and you go back to that vendor and you build trust with that vendor. And they start giving you deals or they start finding things specifically for you. So it's a different way of kind of doing business or shopping. Um, it's based as much on that relationship that you make with your certain, let's say, tomato seller as it would be like here, like, oh, I just want to find the prettiest tomatoes or the best tomatoes. A lot of it's based on that relationship. And so if you're going about it that way, you build a relationship with the person, you talk to the person, you get to know things about their culture, you ask them, and as long as I would say, obviously human beings are all different, but I would say as long as someone's being genuine with you and um, kind of asking things in a way that's respectful, then you'll get your answers. Uh, but with companies, I think the problem is, again, they don't want to do that work. They don't want to send somebody down there for a month at a time so that they can build these relationships so that they can find out you know, if it's okay to use this pattern. Uh, some of them maybe do try, I'm not sure, you know, and it's gonna be different again between like a high-end couture designer versus let's say somebody who's doing like free trade, um, an online website or something. But, but really, that's the crux of it. I mean, it takes time, it takes relationships. Yeah, that was, that was an interesting point that you bring up from this, um, that uh, whether it be um, so many of the different anthropologists that we've talked to or other people that we've had on the show um, that are going back and hanging out with people from different subcultures around the world, it's fascinating because the ones that continuously go back and build community um, are the ones that uh, gain the deepest connections with the other people's uh, psyche and their lineage, and then uh, it doesn't feel like, uh, it feels more like cultural exchange instead of appropriation. Mm. You know, like you said, it's the time, it's the relationship, it's the community th with that. Um, it just feels weird even in the first place for some reason having mm. um, S indigenous subcultures from around the world like selling things um, it, th there's such a strange thing here because it's like selling it mm -hmm. both awakens people to that indigenous mm -hmm. cultural item and artifact and what it means if it's sacred you know all that cool stuff mm -hmm. but then it also loops the whole process into like a transactional economic machinery which then takes them out of poverty, which is always the message that is propagated mm -hmm. by capitalism, and then the uh, and then some of the things happen. Like we're talking to Ramona Perez on the show about how over time it was actually that um, as the uh, indigenous community, indigenous subculture near um, Oaxaca City, mm -hmm. um, actually had uh, more of, of, of uh, resources that they were using for making the, the pottery, um, they actually had to start using more lead instead of mm -hmm. less mm -hmm. lead in that pottery. And then over time, they got lead poisoning mm -hmm. um, from that process. Mm -hmm. And so there's economic machinery causes, like can have a cause like health issues like that too. So there's, there's so much complexity here. Basically, is it that your work, you want to just shine a big like flashlight on this field and this, and this uh, of fashion anthropology and cultural exchange versus appropriation at large. Yes, uh, particularly because I think it is something that keeps happening. I keep seeing news articles about things like appropriating indigenous dress or indigenous aesthetics in one way or the other. We still have museums, um, not all museums, a lot of museums have been doing a great job with things like repatriation, um, but there are still museums who don't do such a great job uh, and who don't do such a great job in knowing how to display certain things versus other things. Um, so we still, we still very much have this culture of take. 
Um, and so just to kind of talk about what are the alternatives to that. And also, yes, just to shine a light because I don't think, even within Ecuador, I remember talking to uh, a friend of mine, a couple of friends of mine, and they're, you know, mestizos. Um, they had no idea that within their own country that Perua designers were doing all this work. And so I was explaining to them what they were doing and, you know, how much these pieces were going for and you know, what they looked like and that there was a buyer's market because there is. And I will say there are mestiza, and I'm saying mestiza women because most of it is women's dress um, for the designers that I work with. Uh, there are mestizas who are models for these designers and who will buy these products too. Um, mm. It's just, it's not as much as the indigenous community and oftentimes uh, it, seems, it seems that those mestiza women uh, have either regional ties, so they might be from the same city, right, in the same area, or they might have some sort of other like family or community tie to the area. Um, it's not the most kind of mainstream, broad swath of the population. So yeah, there's still people within their own country that have no idea that that these designs are being done, that these people, and I mean, they're successful. They're, they're making an income. They're able to sustain themselves on this business, so. This is the next point I wanted to ask mm -hmm. because um, Ramona Perez had a very similar story next to Oaxaca City, the, mm. that indigenous area, yeah. uh, gained, the females gained autonomy, right? Mm -hmm. They gained independence from the pottery, but then the increase in lead, right, caused those health issues, et cetera. Yeah. So then there was like, oh my gosh, what do we do now? Yeah. The decrease in autonomy now happens. Yeah. So, so you also see when, is it is this true that when the the big move in like a, a of, of an indigenous subculture decides to enter their their art into the economic machinery that then women that if they make that art themselves they can become autonomous they can become independent and that can maybe decrease uh, violence that can maybe increase uh, them finding out what they actually care about and want to do in the world and not maybe necessarily just be you know married in having kids and etc yeah, I mean, I think just with uh, even broader female populations, um, I think that I've noticed within the Perua, the women that I've worked with, uh, there are more women who are single later, who are childless, or who at least see these things as a positive as opposed to a negative. Um, for instance, a lot of them will obviously, you know, they'll ask me about my life and their reaction to me being a single woman in the field with a career at 32, yeah, you know how old I am, um, is a very positive reaction, right? And a lot of them also, like Sisa, for example, like she is very independent. She's done this business herself, but part of it is also that she's brought in her female friends to help her. So some of her friends will run the shop when she's, you know, um, sewing in the studio or, you know, she's sewing the studio so one of her friends will go deliver a product that's sold to a girl across town because mm -hmm. uh, she wants to hand deliver it because they're very finely made pieces. Yeah. So she's not only helping herself, she's also helping the women around her in her community. Provide them with work. Providing them with work, providing them sometimes with, you know, spaces to stay, mm. um, you know, and it's much more... Interesting. The way she works, and I would say probably a way that a lot of Purua people work from what I've observed, it's very reciprocal, it's very... People will go get food for one another if the other person can't leave, you know, if they need change, they'll give each other change, and they may be competitors, they may have stores right next to each other. Um, but they hang out, they talk to each other, you know, they do all these things because again, there is also that culture of like, well, this is the person I go to, so I'm always gonna go to that person. So there's several reasons for that. Um, but yeah, I mean, they'll, you know, make food together, hang out. So it's, it's nourishing, not just in the sense of she's giving these women more economic freedom or really they're giving it to themselves, but she's helping them get it. Um, but also that she's, there's a community nourishment, you know, there's this kind of familial relationship between women who are working together uh, that they might not otherwise have. So it is a sense of independence via literally just having more money, but also via like when your friend succeeds, you succeed. Yeah, So the social networks and the mm -hmm. rising tide lifts all boats. Hmm. 
this is so this is so tough to figure out because I I I just I don't know if there's like uh, it's like what mm. what aspects to the excellence of the cultural exchange part mm -hmm. can be amplified the most mm. excellent parts of the culture exchange part being amplified and then there's like the parts that are like are not balanced there's power imbalances like you were mm -hmm. describing um, uh, and uh, th how can you take the appropriational parts mm -hmm. appropriative parts how you can take those and just decrease those or just mm -hmm. eliminate them completely so it becomes basically solely focused on cultural exchange and yeah. not on appropriation yeah honestly one of the ways that it could be done is by hiring more anthropologists who do work that I do within the industry, i.e. the fashion industry, um, to basically tell these designers and these businesses ahead of time, act as a consultant. Say, you know, this is the group I work with. Let me tell you how things work down there. Let me tell you in what ways you can do actual good and what ways you can do harm. And having more of those within businesses may help. A lot of businesses are hiring anthropologists now just in general um, because there's this kind of new buzzword within businesses of like uh, culture, but like a business culture, right? Mm -hmm. um, so they want people who understand how culture works. So part of it, I think, would be the responsibility of those businesses or those designers to take it upon themselves to care enough to hire, whether it's an anthropologist or somebody else who can do the same work, to hire somebody who can do work like that. Uh, but they have to care first. They have to actually worry about the yeah. fact that they're appropriate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so maybe there needs to be some sort of like a, a fir, like a, that, that first principle system that you were initially describing to mm. us on, this is how you focus on cultural exchange. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. First one, again, was ask. Right. And then ask in a way where you recognize your power compared to yep. their power. Mm -hmm. So like ask power, like together mm -hmm, kind of, mm -hmm. ask power. Then, you know, I guess there's just more ask about where yeah. can this, is it sacred, mm -hmm. is it divine? And where you know, your own it? research too. Like there are ways, oftentimes I think with, with people, especially if they're already kind of People like, so within my community, within Ecuador, a lot of indigenous people are so used to anthropologists coming in that they're just kind of like, sure, I'll answer your questions. Which is sad in, to some extent because it means that they're just used to being this kind of endless well of knowledge for people who come, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, a lot of it is asking, living with the population, making real relationships, but also like there's information out there. There's information out there on you know, sacred patterns. There's information out there that exists from other anthropologists or, you know, from other people doing similar work about what these textiles mean within this community. So, like, part of it is you know, also your responsibility to do not just that field work part, but also start looking for articles, start looking for books. Okay, so, the, so these, like, ask and research yes, and that, power all together. Exactly. and understand power, mm -hmm. those are kind of the principles. Are there other ones that we maybe can think of? So Maximizing cultural exchange. Yeah, I mean those are really, those are the core. Outside of that it would really be just kind of fine tuning, then you're already getting into the, specif the specific culture, right? Mm -hmm. Because in some cultures it might be more appropriate to ask in this way versus this way, yeah. or you might want to actually live with a family, or you might yeah. not want to because that might be too invasive. invasive. So it, you really might at that bring point. bring a gift that you've researched that they appreciate that, exactly. that shows that you are ceremoniously exactly. bringing them something. And sometimes um, within field work, there's the question of what are you giving back? And sometimes people are like, well, I, I want to give them money you know, in exchange for, let's say, their time or and whatever. And that may not be right. And oftentimes it's not appropriate. Yeah. Exactly. So... See, the, and then this, is, this brings up the point again of the mm -hmm. whole economic machinery thing, mm -hmm. is that it just, 
like if that's if that's not appropriate mm -hmm. in the in the cultural circumstance, they, they don't want it. They don't want to play in the yeah. big monopoly board game that the whole planet's playing in. Then why is it that then that that their goods even in the first place should enter into the mm -hmm. I guess for awareness about their story? Maybe they don't want that. I mm -hmm. don't know. This is this is all hard to. It all depends, and that's the thing. It all depends. So you have to do research and ask. Yeah, and the thing is, you know. People are going to, if they do, just like the people I work with, they do want their dress to be out there, not as necessarily a bought and sold commodity, although they, they do say pretty much for anyone who likes it, but they want it to be out there because for so many years, even using that dress style was repressed. So mm. for a long time, it's really only been the past 10 years that they've started using this dress style again. Because prior to that, being visibly indigenous, especially if you were trying to go into the city to get a job, if you were trying to, you know, kind of move your way up um, the ladder, you didn't necessarily want to look visibly indigenous because you would get treated terribly. You would get things yelled, I mean, and this does to some extent still happen, but you would get things yelled at you, you would be made to sit in the back of the bus, you would be called dirty, all these, all these different things that are associated with you looking indigenous. So for them, it's actually very, very important that this does circulate and circulates as widely as possible because it's about reclaiming the power to wear that dress okay. and being visibly indigenous. Um, but, you know, again, like you said, there are some groups that may not want anything to do with that. And they may feel the actual planet suffering because mm -hmm. of modernity. Exactly. And they don't and may, want any piece of it. And may not want to enter into the global economy in the same way, right? Yeah. And so, again, it's, it's all going to be very, very specific. Ask, research, do hardcore understanding of that and mm -hmm. understand the power dynamic. Yeah, and then tailor that towards each subculture. Exactly. So, so this is, yeah, this is even going in having read a lot. That is, um, go, go in having read a lot. I mean, wow, what a complex study this is. You, know, you just like open up the can and it's just pouring out. It's endless, just, yes. <laughs> it's just pouring out. And it also, just like the big global economic machinery board game of monopoly that's happening with top-down power structures, it's just, it doesn't feel as though, in, like, I guess, okay, if, in, if you ask and research and indigeneity, the, the subculture says, yes, please, I would like to mm -hmm. feel more empowered wearing my, um, because I wasn't able to previously wear this and feel empowered, so please help me with that process. Or, uh, please do share the story of our subculture mm -hmm. through and every single time somebody gets this, um, the, the, the sacred bracelet with our patterns on it. Please in, in include a card about who we are and why this is sacred in the, in, on your messaging, on your website, on your Instagram, on your uh, Etsy, whatever, Pinterest, et cetera. Just include that. Okay, Amazon. Okay, great. We can do that. Then there's, 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 just what what is what is it why is it that it feels like the planet is saying that modernity is choking ecosystems mm -hmm. and that we have the obsession to continue mm -hmm. propagating uh, subcultures of indigeneity into that machinery mm -hmm. and so that also feels very mm -hmm. makes me feel unwell at the same time well and what you're talking about as modernity is specifically it's not just the the conceptualization of like a modern society, right? It's a very specific modernity. It's a modernity that we're experiencing right now that is a Western modernity that is based on still certain principles of enlightenment, that's based on industrial revolution, that's based on now this mass technology uh, kind of evolution that's happening at such a rapid pace. It's a very, very, very specific form of modernity. Um, so with a lot of indigenous knowledge, what's happening, I think, or uh, what will probably happen is that that is going to start influencing as opposed to, you know, everybody thinks of globalization as like, oh, yeah, Western civilization just goes out and converts all these other places into little mini U.S.s or little mini Europe's or whatever it may be. Um, when in reality, what happens is 
you know, a McDonald's goes into this area and people change it to make it fit their culture better, you know, or it might not succeed because they don't want it. So people really, they absorb what they need, but they don't absorb what they don't need. And I think also there's an increasing uh, movement from the other end influencing Western society or what we're calling Western society. I don't oh, yeah. think it's just a one-way road. I think it's just that we tend to ignore the ways that we're influenced by, let's say, uh, indigenous economies, right? Sure. By ideas of reciprocity. Um, that those are going to get stronger and stronger. And again, that work is being done by people themselves. It's not, it's not up to, you know, us to say, oh yeah, let's integrate this, let's, let's bring these people in, like, they're gonna cause this shift themselves, um, whoever they are, whether it be, you know, uh, activists on the ground, or designers, or artists, or whoever, or uh, people coming up in academia, um, intellectual, intellectuals in that sphere, um, that these people are gonna be doing it themselves that it's really not up to us to say, oh, how do we incorporate you, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I, I like your focus on the absolute positive possibility mm. of this. That's where we aim to well, yeah, that's hone, hope, in, right? <laughs> hone in our attention and focus yeah. on the show towards that as well. So let's, you know, let's say that if you take these best principles of cultural exchange, you know, we go back to the very mm -hmm. first thing we said, which is maybe indigeneity plus modernity mm -hmm. can actually be a good synthesis for a good path forward. Fine. Then you see cultural exchange. Here are yeah. the principles, you know, our, uh, ask, research, power, et cetera, you yeah, know, as yeah. we talked about. If you do that really well, you can maybe take some of the culture of indigeneity and actually really holistically mm -hmm. um, bring it and actually take what is like kind of mm -hmm. like a little bit problematic at times modernity mm -hmm. and actually augment it mm -hmm. quite well potentially. Mm -hmm. Maybe when there's more uh, sacred indigenous uh, uh, arts in modernity maybe people will more frequently be like well what is that very mm -hmm. sacred necklace that you're wearing right now? Mm -hmm. What does it actually mean? Mm -hmm. Oh, it came from this subculture around the world that has this yeah. story where they feel more interconnected all the time in these ways. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, little the same frequency that you see food restaurants in metropolises, mm -hmm. all of a sudden you'll see like little like emotional intelligence centers mm -hmm. and meditation and, and yoga, what meaning union with the divine or with the one mm -hmm. in Sanskrit, that maybe you'll see more of those little centers popping up everywhere. Mm -hmm. So it could, be, it could be a way to evolve consciousness that we don't even know is actually happening yet, like mm -hmm. you're indicating, and I love that. I love that. We're getting there. <laughs> I love that. That's, that's, so as long as there's no appropriation, that's the thing yeah. in the process. Yeah. Decrease the appropriation, increase that beautiful cultural exchange. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I'm down. Yeah. I'm down. It's not that hard. Just a little time, a little effort. <laughs> that, 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 was, that was pretty cool. I like, how we, I like how we got there. Okay, last question. Okay, what's up? Okay. We ask all our guests this. Okay. What is most beautiful? Most beautiful. Well, see, that's interesting from somebody who works in aesthetics. Mm -hmm. Um, beauty is subjective in all ways, so I'd say, you know, on a basic human level, love, empathy, compassion is, for me, the most beautiful thing. Um, I know that sounds a little hokey, but it really is where change comes from. I mean. Yes, change also comes from anger, change also comes from struggle, strife, but whether it be kind of an inner sense of love or a love for your community or a love for someone you've never met before, a love for your environment or the universe or whatever it may be, that's, that's where a lot of real change comes from, I think. I hope. Ashe, <laughs> that means amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Love, empathy, compassion. Yeah, that's right. Anais, this has been such a pleasure. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming on the show. Of course.
Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking about all the cool stuff that Anais was teaching us. Check out her links in the bio below. Support her work. Also, check out the links in the bio below to American Anthropological Association. Check out their links. Support them. You can find all of our links in the bio below to simulation. You can support us. You can find our PayPal, Patreon, cryptocurrency link. You can design cool merch and get paid. All those links are below. And also, support the other artists, the entrepreneurs, spiritual leaders, organizations in your communities and around the world that you believe in. Support them and help them flourish. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest that next world. We love you very much. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you soon. Wow. Yay.